Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the webinar from Protecting Immigrant Families Illinois. If you are here and need Spanish interpretation, please go to, choose, to the interpretation button and choose Spanish language. And we are just gonna wait a few more minutes for everyone to join and then we will get started. And again, we have Spanish interpretation. So please choose the Spanish interpretation button at the bottom. And the English, the, the English pan panelists also need to choose the English language option. Okay. Edith, are you on? If you are on, could you please unmute? She's not on, Andrea. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. It is a little bit past one o'clock. Um, I am getting a message that everyone, everyone um, please, you need to choose either English or Spanish language down at the bottom. Okay, and there will be a Spanish PowerPoint link put in the chat in a moment for those who would like to follow along in um, using slides in Spanish. Oh, I just lost the um, screen. Yeah, I'll reshare it. Okay, thank you. Oh, Edith, I see you. Okay, I think we should be ready to go. Apologies for the um, technical challenges. Edith, would you like to um, start? Okay, well, we're waiting for Edith to join. Um, again, this is the webinar on the final public charge rule from the Protecting Immigrant Families Illinois Coalition. Um, next slide, please. We're so happy that you joined us today. Just a few housekeeping matters. Um, Roberto, the slide is blank. Yeah, it's not showing up for some reason. I don't know if it's... So maybe we'll oh, just, there we, there we go, okay. Sorry, you didn't know that. <laughs> no, it's okay. There is closed captioning enabled. Also, there is an option to put questions in the chat and we will answer questions in the chat. Um, next slide, please. And as I said before, there is Spanish language interpretation available today so please choose that if you would like that next slide today's speakers are carrie chapman from the legal council for health justice fred sow from the illinois coalition for immigrant and refugee rights edith avila olea from icirr as well and myself andrea kovac from the schreiber center on poverty law next slide so what we're going to cover today, we are going to cover what is in the Biden final public charge rule that was published last Friday. Then we're going to talk about next steps. What's next now that this rule has been published? 
Then we're going to talk about outreach and education and resources that we have right now about the new Biden public charge rule, as well as others that are planned. And then we'll have time for some questions and answers. Next slide. So before we dive into what's in the rule, we just wanted to, um, we have a few points that we wanted to Norma, bring up. final, tenemos unos cuantos puntos que queremos cubrir. That we know that public charge is an antiquated policy reflecting more than 100 years of racial and class bias. Public charge has been in um, the immigration law for over 100 years. And I'm actually going to turn it over to Fred to elaborate on this further and to go into more of the bullets. So Fred, take it away. Okay, thanks, Andrea. Um, so again, um, I'm Fred Zhao. I'm the Senior Policy Counsel with the Illinois Coalition for Immigrants and Refugee Rights. Thanks again to everyone for joining here, joining us this afternoon. Um, so yeah, before we go into the details regarding uh, the new the new public charge final rule. Um, we do want to reiterate that you know our you know it's the belief of our organizations that uh, public charge is an antiquated and uh, unfortunately fatally um, fatally biased um, remnant of old immigration policies that date back to the 19th century. Uh, and ultimately, it's our goal to seek uh, repeal of the public charge um, provisions in the immigration laws. Until that day, though, uh, we have public charge as part of the immigration laws. And um, the uh, Department of Homeland Security and um, the, the administration needs to administer this part of the law. Um, what makes this final rule particularly significant is that um, it's an indication from the Biden administration that they recognize that um, the previous public charge rule had a really harmful effect on immigrant communities, uh, in particular a chilling effect on many immigrants who may need uh, various forms of public support. Um, and um, the administration, the new administration is showing its commitment to, you know, enabling people to um, apply for the benefits they qualify for and, um, you know, and, uh, and, you know, use those benefits to, you know, as, as a safety net to, um, you know, to enable them to move forward with their lives. So next, next slide. Okay, so, um, you know, throughout the PIF campaign um, and the PIF Illinois efforts over the last several years, um, we've, uh, you know, we've definitely made a difference. Um, so first off, um, you know, uh, in response to the previous administration's public charge rule, we, uh, many of our organizations um, and many of our allies across the country uh, submitted a, you know, a, you know, a record number of public comments, uh, more than a quarter million comments uh, went into Homeland Security. Um, also, um, you know, uh, various parties um, throughout uh, the country filed nine lawsuits challenging that, um, that version of public charge, including here in Illinois, um, where we, we as PIF Illinois uh, organized a lawsuit. Um, my organization, ICRR, was one of the named plaintiffs. And uh, the Shriver Center and uh, Health and Legal Counsel for Health Justice um, were, you know, and, and, other, and other law firm allies uh, represented us in that litigation. Um, and that litigation, I should note, ended up with a final court judgment uh, striking down that public charge rule. Um, also, um, you know, when the Biden administration took office, they went through a full-blown regulatory process uh, that included, a, a, <clears throat> excuse me, that included an advance notice of public rulemaking or ANPRM, uh, you know, to which uh, five more than 500 comments were submitted, um, including by many of our organizations. And then on, on top of that, um, there was um, 
you know, in, in response to the final rule, there were more than 1,000 comments that were submitted. I believe that, uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, more than 1,000 comments were submitted to the actual final, to the, to the actual proposed rule um, once it was finally published. So, um, moving on then, um, what is in this new final rule? So I'm, I'll get started here and then um, you know, turn this over to Carrie to cover much of the rest of this. So let me present a few notes in the big picture of this rule. So uh, as many of us know, um, Homeland Security published its final rule uh, September 9th, 2022. So one week ago today. Uh, this rule is scheduled to take place uh, right before Christmas, December 23rd, 2022. In the meantime, um, as is the case now, um, or as was the case prior to the, the final rule being published, Homeland Security is following an old guidance from the old INS dating from 1999. And that guidance will remain in effect until the final rule takes effect in December, on December 23rd. Now, uh, as, as the next slide will show, uh, this new final rule pretty much, not yet, not yet, back up. Okay, uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, you know, the, this new final rule pretty much tracks the, the old 1999 guidance. Um, and so as a result of that, much of what we've been saying over the last year or so since the uh, previous administration's rule was, uh, was, was, was revoked, um, all, all that remains in effect. Um, and, um, you know, again, um, you know, it, it was very important for the Biden administration to undertake this rulemaking process and write um, the, you know, what had been a, 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 a relatively informal um, a guidance into actual federal, federal regulations. So now we can move to the next slide. Okay, so uh, as, I, as I noted here, um, not, uh, well, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we're just realizing that instructions were not given in Spanish for interpretation. So I apologize for interrupting. Can I do that really quickly? Yes, please, please. Okay. Um, mil disculpas por haber interrumpido, um, pero queríamos estar seguras de que las personas que necesitan interpretación en español estén conectadas. Así que si ven en la parte de abajo de su pantalla, um, donde está un globito, um, se empieza la palabra interpretation con la letra I, I de iglesia van a presionar ahí ese botón y lo van a escoger donde dice ES para español, que está la palabra en, que dice Spanish. Tenemos aquí un intérprete, así que por favor déjenos saber um, donde dice um, la Q y la A, si tienen algún problema. De nuevo van a escoger el globito, um, que parece como un mundo, y luego que, que abajo tiene la palabra um, en inglés, interpretation, que comienza con la letra I de iglesia, y luego presionan Um, la opción donde dice ES para español y en inglés está escrito Spanish. Y Lubia, déjame añadir que también para, para aquellos que se han unido un poco más tarde, también voy a volver a poner en el chat la presentación en español, por si lo quieren descargar y seguirla a través de ahí. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you, Fred. Apologies again. Okay. No, no problem, Lubia. Thank you. Um, Okay, so um, some more big picture considerations here. Again, um, not much has changed um, in, in the final rule from the 1999 guidance. Um, so the immigration statuses that are subject to public charge is pretty much the same. Uh, the immigration statuses that are exempt from public charge are also pretty much the same, except that um, you know, there have been new laws um, and new protections that have been put in place since, you know, since 1999. So um, many of the newer statuses created by those new laws are, are also exempt from public charge. Um, and I'll go into a few, a few more details uh, in, the, in the next few slides. Uh, which public benefits count? Uh, also is pretty much unchanged uh, from the 1999 guidance. And again, Carrie's gonna cover much of that. The definition of public charge itself um, is substantively the same as it, as it was in 1999. And uh, one really significant change actually is a, is a big improvement. The 1999 guidance 
counted um, benefits used by family members um, against the person who would be considered, you know, who, who would be going through public charge considerations. The, the new final rule actually clarifies that um, family members of, you know, family members who use public benefits um, will not have those benefits count against the person in the household who is going through public charge. Um, so, you know, that basically means, for instance, that an undocumented head of household um, who has U.S. citizen children or U.S. citizen spouse um, who uh, is receiving public benefits, um, you know, that are counted for public charge um, will not have those benefits used by the children or spouse counted against against them uh, as they're going through the immigration process for public charge purposes. So, okay, next slide. Okay, let's say a few more words about uh, when does public charge kick in and who it does not apply to. So um, again, public charge applies to people seeking admission to the United States. Uh, what does that mean? It means that um, when people are applying for a green card, or for many types of temporary visas, um, public charge will apply. Um, it also applies if people are, you know, have green cards, but uh, have been outside the United States for more than 180 days. When those people, you know, try to re-enter the United States, um, they may be subject to public charge considerations uh, as they're re-entering, even though they already have a green card. Okay. Now, um, one thing to note here is that um, this rule is, was issued by the Homeland Security, and it applies to people in the United States or arriving at the United States. Um, so um, there is a parallel rule, which we'll be discussing a little bit later in the presentation, that was issued by the State Department. The State Department rule applies to people applying for visas outside the United States. The State Department rule, by the way, is fairly similar and has pretty much been following what Homeland Security has been doing. But again, keep in mind that this final rule applies to people in the United States or, um, or at a port of entry in the United States. So next slide. Okay, so again, it's important to remember that many, many, many people are not going to be subject to public charge um, because of the statuses that they have or the processes that they're going through. Um, so, for instance, many people who are going through some form of humanitarian protective process, so if they're refugees, if they're applying for asylum, public charge does not apply to them. This also, this is also the case for people who are uh, survivors of human trafficking or survivors of domestic violence uh, or certain other criminal activity who are seeking um, T visas in the case of um, in the case of trafficking or U visas in the case of domestic violence or certain other crimes. Uh, this is also the case for many other um, people going through humanitarian processes. Um, also, um, people who already have green cards do, are not subject to public charge um, if they're, you know, if they're going, if they're applying for citizenship. So public charge does not apply to the process of applying for naturalization or citizenship. It also does not apply if, if they are not traveling outside the United States for more than 180 days. So folks with green cards can travel outside the United States for a shorter amount of time and not be subject to public charge. That's perfectly fine. Uh, it's only if um, they travel for more than, more than 180 days that public charge might kick in. Now, um, there is a really nice website uh, called keepyourbenefits.org, um, which has more information uh, regarding these various exemptions and statuses. Um, so, um, and, you know, I've checked it out myself. It's really cool. So, uh, um, you know, we recommend that uh, if you have questions about which statuses apply, you know, which statuses are subject to public charge and which are not, um, check out keepyourbenefits.org. Uh, next slide. Okay. And then um, again, it's important to note here that, um, you know, 
that you know so far as benefits whether be, whether benefits that um, that are counted for public charge purposes will count in any individual case um, the benefits are not going to be counted if someone is in a in a in an exempt status um, when they receive the benefits, that is one of the, one of the statuses that I went through went over in the last slide. And generally, people who are going through some form of humanitarian process, whether it's refugee resettlement or um, other other forms of um, of benefits that that are available to refugees or to people going through going through hum, uh, humanitarian process, um, none of those benefits will count either. Um, so you know, and you know, this this has become really salient over the last year or so with the, the arrival of many uh, people from Afghanistan. Como año porque hay muchas personas de Afganistán o de Ucrania que están recibiendo el estatus. A complete list of the exemptions uh, in the federal regulations. Uh, the site appears on your screen here. 8, C, 8 CFR section two twelve point two three. Okay, so with that, uh, I will turn this over to um, our colleague, Carrie Chapman. So Carrie, take it away. Hey, everybody. Um, so um, now we've sort of gotten to the, to the uh, new place that we're starting from, which is the definition of public charge under the new final rule. Um, so as Fred mentioned, there's um, statutory language. So there's a federal law passed by Congress, signed by the president, um, that notes the um, fact that you may not be able to um, adjust your status or get admission to the U.S. if you are a public charge, but that statute doesn't actually define public charge. So the reason that we're having this discussion today is that the previous administration and the current administration have both sought through rulemaking, so the promulgation of a regulation, a federal regulation, to define what the statute does not define. And so under the new regulation, just published as final by the Biden administration, the definition of public charge is someone who is likely at any time to become primarily dependent on the government for subsistence as demonstrated by either the receipt of public cash assistance for income maintenance or long-term institutionalization at government expense. And I read that carefully because basically every word in the definition is significant um, and is further explained in the regulations. Um, so now we're gonna break that down a little bit and we'll go to the next slide. Um, so what benefits use um, is gonna be considered in the public charge test? Um, and so specifically the test itself, the definition of public charge, which creates a test, talks about public assistance, public cash assistance for income maintenance and long-term institutionalization at government expense. So what counts as public cash assistance for income maintenance? The rule tells us SSI, Supplemental Security Income, again, received by the person seeking the green card or seeking admission or adjustment, not by their family members. Temporary assistance for needy families, also known as TANF, um, cash assistance, cash welfare. Um, and again, TANF cash only or child only cases are not counted in a parent's immigration application. So if the parent themselves is not receiving TANF benefits, even if their child is receiving benefits, the child's use of TANF will not be counted against the parent when the parent goes to adjust. And in addition, state, tribal, territorial, or local cash assistance for income maintenance. And so generally what they're thinking about here are programs like general assistance and township assistance, GA and TA, uh, which are less familiar to those of us who practice in Cook County because we haven't had this in a while. But if you um, go outside of Cook County, you'll see that there's uh, um, still some cash assistance, some general assistance or township assistance available to folks. Um, obviously, the cash piece is going to be one of the toughest pieces um, to help people understand and explain, and we're going to talk uh, in even more detail in a little bit about it. Um, and then uh, long-term institutionalization at government expense 
is limited to institutional services, basically like a nursing home um, or a mental health institution. And it doesn't include short-term stays in those facilities, rehab uh, stays, imprisonment or home and community-based services. So it is just long-term residents in, for example, a nursing home at government expense. So being paid for by the state of Illinois or another government entity. All right, next slide. Um, the rule very explicitly says what is covered and says only these things are covered. Um, only these things will count against you. Um, but it's also important, obviously, for us to talk about what that means is excluded from consideration. And so generally speaking, um, health coverage programs are excluded. So Medicaid, Medicaid-like programs, Marketplace, Medicare are not considered except to the extent that in Medicaid, someone is getting their nursing home um, paid for or their uh, long-term um, mental health institutionalization paid for. So again, what that means is the new health benefits for immigrant adults and health benefits for immigrant seniors and all kids and moms and babies and being an ACA adult or getting a ABD um, uh, Medicaid because you're a senior or a person with disabilities do not count. They are not considered if you, if and when you are put to the public charge test. Likewise, healthcare that you get at community health centers, charity care or hospital financial assistance, COVID testing treatment and vaccines, immunizations, um, and other public health measures are not considered in a public charge analysis. So really important, I think, for everybody to understand because this is different than the Trump rule, um, is that health coverage programs are not included and it's only folks who have their long-term care being paid for in an institution by a government entity um, that will have that benefits you scrutinized when they go to get their green card. Next slide. So also not considered are nutrition programs, SNAP and WIC. Again, SNAP um, was considered under the, the previous administration's rule. Uh, subsidized housing, so uh, Section 8 housing choice vouchers or project-based. Um, disaster assistance, pandemic assistance, um, utility assistance like LIHEAP, child care assistance are all special purpose or supplemental benefits, and they are not included in a public charge analysis. So use of those benefits will not be considered when the person seeks to adjust. Um, the or tax credits are not considered public benefits that would um, have to be counted against you if you um, were subject to the public charge test. Uh, and someone just asked in the questions, what about cash assistance to the IFSP program? And we did an analysis of this just the other day and Andrea is writing out an answer, but no. Uh, those are generally, they're generally speaking one time, which means they can't be for an income maintenance. Um, and there are a couple of other things that exclude them. But please ask questions like that because that's exactly what we're trying to sort of help folks understand in this webinar. Next slide. So again, I just wanna say and say and say again because I'm hoping um, that you uh, will say and say and say this again, <laughs> um, is that benefits received by family members who are not applying for immigration status, like US citizen children, will not be considered. Um, the non-citizen who's applying for the change in status or admission has to be listed as the beneficiary of the benefits, which is different than being the head of household in a public benefits case, right? If you have a TANF child only case, then let's say mom is head of household but she is not a beneficiary in that case. She's not a beneficiary of the TANF benefits. And therefore the fact that TANF came into the household that she's a head of household for won't ding her. Uh, what does not count, again, what also does not count as receipt of benefits is applying for a benefit on your own behalf or that of another. So applying for those benefits like a child only TANF grant, or if you think you're eligible for a benefit, 
um, and you just apply, but then you stop and withdraw your application, and then mere application does not count as receipt. Um, if uh, you are approved for future receipt of benefits, that does not count as receipt at the present moment when you go to adjust and you're subject to the public charge test if you are in fact subject. Um, or receipt of benefits solely on behalf of another person. Again, like that TANF child only. Um, so I just a couple of questions. What will happen to people labeled a public charge under the previous administration's rule? So uh, truthfully, there were a very small number of those folks, I think nationwide, they were under 10 people. Um, and the truth is they were appropriately subject to the rule. Um, and so they may have other individual options in their individual immigration cases, but um, they uh, were properly put to the rule. Um, and US um, CIS and DHS have told us that they're not going back to undo those. But what's happening in those very small number of individual cases, we don't know, right? There might be an option um, for those folks based on the individual facts of their case. Next slide. Um, so again, what does receipt of benefits means? We've got an example of Rosa applying for her green card through a family immigration pathway, right? So she's at the right point in time. She's getting her green card. So she might be subject to public charge and she's using a pathway um, that generally the public charge test is applied to. So her, um, she is gonna be subject to the test. They're gonna put her through this evaluation as part of deciding whether to give her a green card. Um, if she completed an application for her U.S. citizen child to receive TANF, while she's subject to the test, the citizen child's use of TANF isn't counted against her under the new rule. All right, next slide. So just a couple more takeaways. Um, the, within the statute, the immigration statute, it requires that the public charge test consider the totality of the circumstances of the immigrant who's applying for status. And it specifically lists looking at their age, health, family status, assets, resources, and financial assistance, education, and skills. And so there will be some analysis of those things for immigrants who are subject to the test um, at the time that they seek admission or seek to adjust. Um, it, it look, there's nothing in the regulation defining those terms as there was under the Trump rule, um, but we do expect ultimately USCIS to issue guidance about those factors. Um, and the rule does describe some of the evidence um, that can be used to support certain factors, but there's not a lot of detail in the rule and they're not specifically defined in the rule. So we'll, I think, be hearing more about those factors in sub-regulatory guidance. Um, and it does favorably consider the affidavit of support, um, which most folks who are gonna be subject to the rule are gonna have to file an affidavit of support as a part of their adjustment application. Um, and those will be favorably considered as factors um, in whether or not a person is a public charge. The rule also makes clear that disability alone isn't sufficient to be determined a public charge under the Trump rule. It seemed as though somebody with a disability might end up meeting enough criteria. Um, that um, basically just by virtue of them having a disability, they would be determined to public charge. The current rule makes clear that that's not permissible. Um, and also that the uh, officers adjudicating people's admissibility or adjustment um, have to give a reason for each public charge determination. So next slide. All right, what's next? Um, so now I think, oh, I think I'm still doing what ne what's next. Sorry, guys. No, no, I mean, I think it's still me. <laughs> Sorry, so next slide. But somebody jump in if I'm stepping on your territory. Um, so the rule takes effect on December 23rd, 2022, which means the 1999 guidance is in effect until that date. Um, USCIS is going to update their policy manual, so that's their um, sub-regulatory um, rules for administering the program. Um, so they're going to put on their website their policies um, for agency officers to use in administering the rules, and they'll publish a new um, I-4085 that will mirror the rule. Um, and it is likely that the final rule, the Biden final rule, will be challenged in court, um, that our uh, friends and neighbors in um, 
red states will be filing litigation against the rule. Um, and so we will keep you posted um, about how that litigation is going. Next slide. Um, and as Fred noted, um, applications processed outside the US through um, consular processing, through a, a process that's happening in consulates in other countries, US consulates in other countries, um, is also ultimately going to be updated. So the agency or the, the agency is still reviewing the comments it received. Um, and it, the current policy um, that it's operating under is similar to the 1999 guidance um, as the as we're using the 1999 guidance for folks who are already here. Um, and um, the Department of State, the agency that um, does this, uh, administers consular processing, is going to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking, and then there'll be a comment period, and then there'll be a final rule, just as there was for um, the USCIS rule. Um, and we expect that it will be consistent with the rule that's just been published now. Next slide. All right, now outreach and education. Now I am passing the baton. I will take the baton. Thank you, Carrie, so much. All right, <clears throat> so this slide is gonna go over the key messages that we want you all to, to uh, walk away with. And it will be a repeat, but that's because this is so important. Um, we really want you to have this drilled in. So remember, as Fred said, many immigrants will never be assessed under the public charge test. For those who will be subject to the public charge test, enrollment in health coverage is not counted. And enrollment in nutrition programs such as SNAP and WIC housing programs are also not counted they are safe and this didn't change with the new public charge rule it was already safe to enroll in these programs and it is still safe so if you're thinking to yourself well what does that mean for the health benefit for immigrant adults program and the health benefit for immigrant seniors program and the other programs we've listed here these programs are not considered under the public charge test. Enrollment in these programs are not considered under the public charge test. So it is now is the time for everyone who are eligible for these programs to enroll in these programs to get the care and the help that families need and that we are still working on public charge, not just to do outreach and education on the new rule, but our work will be continuing to repeal the public charge in immigration law and that there um, please reach out to us if you think of questions after this webinar about public charge or if you would like a presentation for your group our email address is piffillinois at povertylaw.org next slide and Fred previewed this for us on a previous slide, but I wanted to repeat it again, that there is this wonderful website called keepyourbenefits.org. It was originally created just for California, but then everybody thought it was so helpful that um, it was modified to apply nationally. So the information here applies to all 50 states and it's available in Spanish, simple Chinese, and English. And basically, it's a great website for an individual who is wondering whether they are actually going to be subject to the public charge test to answer just a few questions about their own individual immigration status and situation. And the guide will then tell the person, inform the person if they are subject to public charge. So we wanted to just flag that again for you all. Next slide. In addition, Protecting Immigrant Families Illinois, we are working to update our website to reflect the new Biden public charge rule. So please check out our website. We also will be posting fact sheets on the new rule in English, Spanish, and other languages. We have issue specific fact sheets that have been updated and remember everyone will get a copy of these slides 
And these issue specific fact sheets take a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, particular topics. So for instance, we have one that's just looking at health insurance and whether there's any public charge implications for enrolling in health insurance. We have a fact sheet on moms and babies that is focused on the population that is eligible for moms and babies. We have a fact sheet um, from that is also uh, co-authored by Healthy Illinois that is with uh, or excuse me that covers the health benefits for immigrant seniors program and the health benefit for immigrant adults program. And we have a fact sheet that's focused on emergency Medicaid and has a section on public charge as well. And we have our email repeated here again. Next slide. In addition, we did want to let you know that the National Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition has created and launched an entire toolkit that is geared towards education and outreach on the new Biden public charge rule. So we have links to that toolkit here in this document or on this slide rather. And we have previews of um, some of the documents that they have, including a document called Does Public Charge Apply to Me that is available in nine languages. Next slide, please. We also wanted to let you know that the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, which is the immigration agency that promulgated this rule, is planning to do an outreach and education strategy. In fact, they've already begun in, in so far as they've participated on a webinar for the National Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition. They said on that webinar that they are planning to have their own webinar um, later on in September where they plan to discuss the new public charge role and that um, if folks want to learn more about how to sign up for that webinar or get any other alerts to do so on the link that uh, has been provided in this slide. If you click on this link, it's a way to um, just sign up to get these alerts from DHS and one of those alerts will be to sign up for this webinar that's forthcoming later in September. The other thing I wanted to mention is that on the webinar um, with PIF National, the Department of Homeland Security said that they are interested in putting in, in um, helping spread the word about particular state specific programs and whether or not they're counted under public charge. So please use the PIF Illinois at povertylaw.org email address as a way to send us questions that you may have about whether a particular program is subject to the public charge test. And if we can't um, find the answer for you in the body of the actual rule, um, it, it can be a program that we send to the Department of Homeland Security and we can ask them for an answer. Next slide, please. So we have reached the end of our presentation and we have 15 minutes left for questions. If you could put your questions in the Q&A box, that would be super helpful. Um, and if you think of a question after the presentation, please feel free to email us at piffillinois at povertylaw.org or respond back to um, you can email the, the email address where the presentation will be uh, coming from as well. So um, if we could go to the last slide. I think we have one more slide. And that's just thank you with a picture of a really cute kid. So with that, um, why don't we stop sharing the screen and we will go right to questions. Si tienen preguntas, las pueden hacer en el chat también. Just saying that they could put the, the questions in Spanish as well. And we could go over some of what's been put in the Q&A if folks don't have questions right now, but I just want to make sure that people have an opportunity to ask new questions.
Okay, I'm going to try this. Um, I'm having technical difficulties. My Zoom is not, the sound is not working. So I'm also on my phone. So you see two of me. I know that I had volunteered to lead the section and I don't see any new questions. So I can read uh, some of the questions that we have received and have already been answered so that- so, um, Edith, we do have one new question or a couple of new questions. So the first oh. new question is, how does this affect DACA recipients? Okay. So I can start and then someone can jump in. Um, so someone who, when someone applies for DACA, there is no public charge test. If someone has DACA, already has active DACA status, and they are going to renew their DACA, there is no public charge test. If someone who has DACA status um, seeks to adjust to a green to be to become a green card holder and receive lawful permanent resident status, and they do so using the family immigration pathway, so maybe they meet and marry a US citizen, for instance. If they're adjusting using the family immigration pathway, then they will be subject to the public charge test. So hopefully that answered your question. But one thing to understand is that we, we don't really generally extend benefits to DACA recipients. So again, one of the things about public charge that's super important to realize is that the number of people who will be subject to the test at some point who are eligible for a benefit that will be counted against them, the overlap of those two things is very, very small. So uh, DACA recipients have limited access to public benefits, and so they are potentially subject to the public charge test if they adjust through a family-based pathway, but because they can't get benefits, generally speaking, there's no benefits to ding them in the test. So another question is, um, in the event that changes to public charge do happen, um, what will or can the state of Illinois do to protect um, benefits for immigrant families? Um, and I guess what I would say is, um, it's a little bit hard to predict that because we don't know what kind of changes to public charge might happen. So if, for example, under the Trump rule, um, there were, you know, some protections for for state fully state funded funded benefits and some complications to that. So there were things under the Trump rule that Illinois might have been able to do to help folks. But it's really just going to depend upon what the future might look like. And and so there could be things Illinois can do, but it's really hard to predict them because we, we're, all we can do really is talk about the rule that we have, the 1999 guidance that's in effect now um, and the final Biden rule. So I just don't know that I can say anything meaningful about what might happen in the future in terms of Illinois being protective, but certainly we're motivated in this state to make sure that people can live secure, healthy lives. And so we would certainly, I think as a state do everything we could. So there's a question, what if they have a joint sponsor, the petitioner is safe from public charge? Um, so having a joint sponsor will I, strengthen the application, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're safe from public charge. If, if someone is adjusting under the family immigration pathway, they will be subject to public charge. I saw Fred um, come on in. Do you have an answer for this, Fred? Yeah, this is actually a follow-up to a previously answered question. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, so the, the original question had to do with a permanent resident who wants to sponsor a relative. And you know, so the, the, the permanent residents the permanent residents themselves would not be subject to public charge when they sponsor somebody. But as Luvia noted in the Q&A, the, um, the, the sponsoring permanent resident would need to file an affidavit of support 
to uh, establish that um, they have sufficient income and resources to support the relatives that they are sponsoring. Um, so the follow-up question, whoop, sorry. So yeah. The sorry, Fred, I moved it, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, so the follow-up question is, um, you know, if the, what if they have a joint sponsor, the petitioner is safe from public charge. The petitioner would not be subject to public charge at all. So it's only a matter of whether the petitioner, whether the petitioning permanent resident has the resources to complete a satisfactory affidavit of support. And if, if, the, um, if the sponsoring permanent resident does not have sufficient resources, then that's where that, in, in those cases, the sponsor may need a joint sponsor who in turn can you know, make, up, make up whatever difference um, or assume responsibility for the, the, the sponsored relative. So I hope that answers the question, if not necessarily succinctly. Well, there's a question in Spanish, um, and I'm not too sure what exactly the person means. So Mariana, um, I'm just going to ask in Spanish what she means. Um, ¿Puede, por favor, um, um, explicar un poquito más su pregunta? Um, ¿Qué quiere preguntar en cuanto a qué afecta la carga pública a las personas? The question is a little just vague, so I'm just asking for a follow-up. There's Mariana, another... Oh. Mariana, lo que, lo que puedo hacer es, es, le puedo dejar hablar. Si quieres explicarlo, puedo abrirle el micrófono y puede usted hablar. Le voy a dar Por unos favor. segundos. Claro. Si quiere, Mariana, se puede quitar el mute y hablar. Ok. Hola a todos. Uh... Hello, sí. everyone. I'd like to know a little bit more about, more specifically, about the way people would be affected with respect to public charge. I'm not too familiar with this issue of public charge, but I am definitely interested in getting more information because I assist customers and clients every day with respect to public benefits. And currently, a lot of these uh, public benefits may not be affected by the public charge notion, but I would like to understand some sort of a difference uh, between those who are directly affected and in which ways they are. May the interpreter be allowed to finish the rendition? Um, so Mariana, Mariana, I'm just going to translate, um, try to do a summary translation and then answer her first in English and then answer her question in Spanish. Um, so Mariana is, ask, is saying that she helps many individuals enroll in public benefits um, and she's not too sure what is the difference um, for people that, in, that public charge may um, apply to them and for those that don't. So she just wants to get a better understanding um, when it comes to how um, public charge could affect people. And I just said that the, the answer might be a little lengthy, so we may have to continue it offline. Um, así que, Mariana, para aquellas personas que les pueda afectar la carga pública, déjame primero <coughs> estar segura que, que, que entiendes que la mayoría de las personas que les afecta es aquellas personas um, que o una están fuera de Estados Unidos y quieren aplicar para un tipo de visa, se le van a hacer ciertas preguntas, un, un tipo, por decir, como un examen. Para aquellas personas que están aquí en Estados Unidos y quieren arreglar su estatus, ya sea de indocumentado, a residente o, a, o algún otro tipo de estatus, de por un familiar, puede ser que les afecta. Um, ¿Qué quiere decir que les afecta? Pues eso quiere decir que si la persona, si el oficial de inmigración um, determina que la persona puede ser una carga pública, le puede negar la visa o le puede negar la residencia. No sé si eso contestó tu pregunta, sino con mucho gusto pongo mi correo y me puedes dar seguimiento después. And there was one more question, I think maybe it's worth answering for the group, which is... Um, Give me a second, Kara. I just, oh, I, sorry. I explained it, so I just want to make sure Mariana understood it. So, ¿me puedes dejar saber, sure, yeah. Mariana? I'm not sure if she's here. So, I'll just... Ex okay. Mariana, si te quieres quitar de mute, ¿me puedes dejar saber si, me, si te contesté la pregunta? 
Eh, sí me contestaste parte de mi pregunta, pero sí me gustaría uh, profundizar un poco más. Yes, you did answer my question in part, but I would like to uh, delve deeper, deeper into it. Um, really quickly, what I explained to Mariana is for people that public charge does apply to, and again, as a reminder, that's for people that are seeking a visa, some type of visa outside of the U.S., or for people that are trying to adjust their status within the U.S. through a family member, either going from undocumented to a green card or some other um, status. Again, mainly, not all, but mainly through a family member. What it means is if immigration finds that the person is a public can be a public charge, then they could either one, be denied the visa or denied a green card. Again, depending on a couple of different circumstances. Mariana still has other questions. So I'm just going to go ahead and offer my email so I could follow up with her. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, we forgot to say that. that, that what happens when you're subject to the public charge test is that you will be denied the green card or you will be denied entry into the U.S. So the, the consequences are quite significant, which is uh, why people are concerned and why we're doing things like this webinar. Um, there was a question, is there a concern for folks receiving health benefits for immigrant adults and seniors to access long-term care? Is that considered government expense? Um, so it would be considered government expense um, if those programs in fact covered uh, nursing home care or long-term care. Um, but at this moment, they don't. Um, so the programs themselves, the healthcare component of the program themselves do not count and they do not cover long-term care right now. Um, and so it's a non-issue at the moment. If the programs were expanded to include nursing home care, for example, then that would be a different story. And we'd have to, to cross that bridge when we come to it. But for the moment, um, they do not cover long-term care um, institutionalization. So they don't cover nurse residents in a nursing home. Um, and so use of the programs themselves does not count against you in a public charge analysis. All right, so I think we may have come to the end of most of our questions for the moment. Obviously, there are going to be lots of questions going forward, and we, you know, appreciate and understand that. Um, I, I can close us out. I guess it's right at two. Or Andrea, if you want to jump back in, we really appreciate you guys coming today. Um, again, all of us um, at Pith Illinois are available to have conversations, to do presentations. We'll share materials with you going forward. We'll try to keep you up on every aspect of public charge. Uh, so the, the uh, quick question that came in is the financial assistance cur currently being granted to members of the community affected by COVID-19 from federal and state funds, public, will it make you a public charge? Generally speaking, no, disaster assistance um, does not. Um, and so ARPA money and other money would not count against you uh, in a public charge test. But um, when anyone's getting a specific benefit, we can always help um, give individual advice and information about um, whether the benefit would count against them. But no, generally those, uh, the rule states that those programs are like disaster um, relief programs and are not counted in a public charge analysis. All right, well, uh, stay tuned for more from us. Um, please keep sending us your questions um, and uh, please feel free to um, join us in, in PIP Illinois. Um, and get on the listserv, et cetera. And Andrea, is there anything else I need to say? I'm probably not the best person to have done this ending. <laughs> you did great. So we will follow up with the slides and we will make sure that everyone who registered for this not only gets the slides, but knows how to contact us if you have further questions. Thank you so much. Take care, bye-bye.